Yes, my name is Big Lou, and you are now listening to Go Produce. We're the show that explores how music industry professionals turn their passions into profit. If you're curious to learn more about how the indigenous music community is thriving and how you can help support them, then this episode is for you. Thank you, Factor, for funding part of this initiative. Today's theme is, where is the future of indigenous music going and where did it come from? Our guest is Alan Grayeyes. He owns and operates the artist and project management firm called Ogichida Arts. He produces the Sakihiwe Festival and he volunteers on the board of directors for the Polaris Music Prize, the Indigenous Steering Committee for the National Music Center, and the Rap and Indigenous Category Committees for the Juno Awards. With 13 years of experience at Manitoba Music in his past, I bring you Alan Gray Eyes. Thank you, Big Lou. Yes, yes. No, no clap, grumpy sound guy. What is this? What is this? <laughs> yes. Thank you, yeah. Alan, for being here. I want you to know that we do very much appreciate your time. So because of that, let's make the most of it and go produce. Our first Sounds segment good. for today. Yes, sir. Our first segment for today is called The Basics. Oh, oh. You got to get nice and loose and limber, you know? That's why we, we play these dance vibes, get into the mood of this nice. thing. Nice. What we're going to do in the basics is we're going to touch on some of your roots, figure out where you came from, the way you think, essentially, so that we can all move forward on the same frequency. That makes sense? Yes, sir. Beautiful. Yes, sir. Beautiful. My favorite question to start off is, what is your first musical memory? Oh, I think it was getting the Tone Loc uh, tape from my mom. Because I think back in uh, the early 1990s, 80s, um, wasn't a lot of rap, wasn't a lot of hip hop available. And so I remember that day when my mom brought that tape back. Yeah. Is there a particular yeah, song yeah. that's maybe seared into memory? Well, I think the main song was Funky Cole Medina. And uh, yeah, it wasn't the best. And I, I actually, I guess like the, the better example would be like Rap Tracks Volume I don't know, maybe volume three. Yeah. Um, that had a little, like a little bit more uh, like pop song and, and hip hop, fun, like some of the good hip hop. Way back playbacks. That's awesome. That's awesome. And was that at all a, a, a spark into the rest of your music career? Did you consider music even to be a career then? Or was it just a cool gift that your mom introduced to the family? Yeah, you know what? It was something actually was a friend of the family was talking about it and I really was interested in it. Uh, a little later on, uh, I guess in the early 90s, I definitely dug deeper into hip hop culture and I, I was a huge fan of magazine culture. So Double XL, uh, The Source magazine and photography, editorial writing. Those are kind of my entry points to music industry. And so um, uh, in the late 90s, I started promoting shows with some friends. Um, and then obviously with promoting shows, you need to be able to do graphic design. The photography def definitely helped um, and the editorial writing with the, with the marketing and publicity. So I think it was just a series of, or a number of years of losing money and then <laughs> figuring out how to do it uh, at, a, at a higher level. It's, it's definitely a skill and ability to do that. And it uh, does require time. You've got to invest in that. Um, were you always interested in promoting hip hop events or is that almost what got you into the world of music? I think for me, it was more about creating a space for indigenous folks my age to come together and, uh, you know, do the networking, um, that's available, readily available on social media nowadays. So back in the early two thousands, late nineties, we didn't have those spaces. And right. I think like, we've also seen the rise of a tribe called red. I mean, they really came through with uh, the electric powwow and again, providing a space for indigenous creatives and, and young folks to, to meet each other and exchange ideas and, and build community. And that's kind of really what got me into promoting shows was providing that space. That's awesome. It's awesome. People, people need the space to thrive. I mean, people like Tribe Called Red, they're able to carve their way through. And that story is very inspiring to everyone else. But community space is incredible incredibly crucial for development in any kind. So it's very cool that you're able to provide that for people. What was the first lesson that you learned when you entered this industry? Um, be ready to lose money. <laughs> that's kind of, that's, that's kind of it. It's just like real. always like have money, like wherever you're, whatever you're doing, 
have money set aside just in case things don't work out. So that was the number one lesson. And then, um, yeah, losing money is always a concern. And so figuring how, uh, the next step was figuring out how to do it at a, at a higher level, registering businesses, registering nonprofits and accessing the wonderful grant system here in Canada yeah. was uh, like a third or fourth step. So again, doing it um, to, to create space for community, again, to create space for excellence and for artists to thrive, but also doing it in a way that I don't lose money. I think we're all trying to accomplish that, <laughs> it's but it's tough. cool. Especially like nowadays, like with the pandemic and things changing, like we're all developing new skills, developing new teams and try to make do with like uh, restrictions and lockdowns. Like right now I'm working on a project with the high commission of Canada in the United Kingdom. And every week is kind of like, you know what, we have to make these changes to the project to, to meet safety concerns or to not put people in risk. And so it's uh, scaling back on our productions, um, finding ways to record things on our own and uh, continue to deliver a high level of uh, service or a great product is, is always a challenge. It's so true. It's so true, especially with COVID, not to spend too much time on it, but like it really tests your adversity and your perseverance. And going into any kind of world as an artist, you're essentially an entrepreneur. At the beginning, you're a small entrepreneur and you have to grow that business and be very aware that with that path comes hardship. COVID just highlighted it all here. It's very concentrated. But regardless of that, you're going to see that situation everywhere. No. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think like it's been interesting talking to some indigenous artists across the country. It's like I've been asking them, like, how is how have your plans changed since the pandemic? And uh, what do you have planned for the upcoming year? And for a lot of artists, I'm surprised, especially indigenous artists, is that, you know what, they're planning one month, two months in advance. And so like the uncertainty that the pandemic has provided, unfortunately, is has been a reality for these artists for a long time already. And so yeah. I think like the the really what, what that makes me want to do is like just provide uh, more supports, more presenters, more conferences, more marketing and more networking events for these artists so they can continue to like plan further in, in advance. Like you shouldn't yes, have sir. to live month to month as an artist or a creator. Yeah. You should be able to, you know, plan a year in advance, two years in advance and have some financial security. That's awesome. That's awesome. How do you are, so this is almost the first for you being able to create this community online. How has that experience been for you so far? Not to highlight COVID though, um, the transition, to being virtual, if you will. How is that going I, for you? Yeah, yeah. Well, like again, like moving things online has required a number of, like to develop new skills and also new teams. But again, it, it cuts down our, um, our travel times. It cuts down like all the commutes. And so uh, I'm finding at least is, you know, community is readily available because we can just join each other on Zoom. Like William Prince is an incredible artist. He's also my cousin. He lives down the street, but um, you know, while he's touring, I barely get to see him. And so now like um, throughout the summer, we weren't on lockdown in the summer here. So we were able to get together for barbecues and fires and have dinners and stuff. And then um, throughout the pandemic and the lockdown situations, we've been able to get together on Zoom, which is really nice. Yeah, the world of collaboration has changed. Yeah, so it's it a very has cool changed. transition. I'm also, I'm also working with another artist, a singer songwriter out of Bella Coola. And so what's been great is that before the pandemic, we had submitted an, an application, a grant to the Canada Council to do um, networking and artistic networking development. So she do songwriting and co-writes and with folks in Nashville. And since the pandemic, we were able to actually move that project online. And so instead of doing two weeks of co-writes in Nashville, which would be like one or two a day. So maybe we were thinking, you know, she might get 20 co-writes. She's doing, I think, 18 co-writes every month for the month of September, October, November, December, and January. And so it grew like triple the number of people she's able to connect with and also just being able to stay home and 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 get that money out into the to, to the community of songwriters so yeah it's been really great and and like i said moving things online gives us more time and um uh, more possibilities have you had any specific difficulties doing this before we move on to the next topic 
You know what? Moving online has been really hard. And like, like I said, developing the skills has been a challenge. For the Sekihiwe Festival, we present, I think, between 20 and 30 artists every year. And for the most part, the artists that we had this year had never done a live streaming concert before. And so it was an investment of time. We had a technical consultant who would do um, Zoom chats with the artists ahead of time to make sure that they knew what kind of equipment they needed. And sometimes mm -hmm. we gave them equipment. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the skills and, and the um, software that was required um, to make their performances work. And so again, it's been not only a learning process for us, but also for the artists that we worked with and presented it throughout the Growing summer. pains, growing pains for everyone, yes. yes but such definitely. is life, such is life, it's part of it, yes. Yeah, yeah, and like, like for me, like I love the music industry because it's constantly changing and you're constantly forced to develop new skills and develop new knowledge. And so I think like platforms like this, like podcasts are extremely important because you get to, to hear other people's perspectives. Every once in a while, they'll talk about like a, a technology or a platform that they're using. And I write those down. I search them right away. And that's yeah. like, I've been in this game since like, I think full time since 2005. And so it's been, uh, I continue to learn every day and, and make those investments of time. Every single day, every single day. It's part of it. I like that. I like that. Yeah, definitely. Beautiful. And like, like what I'm learning too is there was a podcast I was listening to a couple of weeks ago about the K-pop model, business model. Yeah. What was really interesting to me is that, um, you know, merchandise sales um, account for the same percentage of their annual revenue that live performance does. And so it made me like, think like, you know what? I really, I really need to step up my merch game. I really wow. need to step up my, my mailing list subscription strategy, my, uh, you know, the marketing campaigns, the artist funnels and everything. Yeah. Like I need to start taking this more seriously. It's not just like an afterthought. It, it can be just as it's real as, right now. Um, yeah. As valuable as your live performance where we tend to like dedicate all of our time. Which is almost non-existent today. Do you yeah, by it chance non existent? But I, I mean, like for some people, it, it's, it's been easier, like yeah. just performing from your home. And you can even, there's some software, I don't know what it is, I can't remember what it's called, but you can geotag uh, or limit your performances to certain markets as well. And so it kind of mimics the tour route where it's just oh, a, interesting. an experience for, for people in a certain city or a certain country. And so yeah. I think things, technology is starting to catch up. And the idea of being able to reach multiple uh, parts of the world in the same day is pretty at the same time appealing even. to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at true. the same time because it's true. Like on the management side, I'm still trying to figure out like how we launch album releases in multiple countries at the same time. And so developing these new skills with technology has been, you know, like, like a, an entry point at least. Yeah, I hear that. Beautiful. That was the basics. We will be moving. <laughs> Not so basic. I mean, we try. We try to introduce you in such a way that you aren't introduced in other places. And I think we need this, to work that on those gibble, transitions, it was man. Those transitions need to be smoother, please. Oh my goodness! If you haven't already <laughs> met our grumpy sound guy, this is him, and he is very good at being grumpy. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Moving nicely into our next segment, we've got. What's your take? Okay. All right. In what's your take, we're going to gear the questions more towards getting your perspective on different matters. I might throw a little bit ridiculous kind of statements or ideas towards you just to not necessarily get a reaction, but to see the emotion in your answer. Does that make sense? I think so. <laughs> Let's just get to it then. Restricting... How much of our youths express themselves is beneficial to the health of our communities? Okay, I'll repeat that. Restricting how much our youths can express themselves is beneficial to the health of our communities. What's your no, take? I, I think the opposite. I think it's uh, artistic expression is the key to uh, mental health um, for youth in the communities. I think you got to be able to express how you're feeling to the world, if not um, your, your friends and family. And I, and I believe like a, a big part of the suicide epidemic is because kids don't have any other options um, to, to show the, the community how they feel. So I think yeah, ex self-expression, especially through the arts is super important. Do you find that there are ways that society or parents 
may suppress these forms of expression and perhaps they can they're not even aware that they're doing this how are there ways that they can navigate away from that behavior well well i i worry about access to the arts for first nation kids in in canada because we've already seen that there's a huge um, gap in the amount of money the the government spends on education for first nation students and so if they're not even getting the opportunity to learn um, at a high level, like to learn the basics like history or, or language arts at a high level, um, oftentimes music and the arts are overlooked. And so I, I do think that um, like our, our, our society in Canada is very, uh, is, is limiting the ability of indigenous youth to, to express themselves through the arts. And that's something that we're working on changing you very adamantly, which is very awesome. Do you see a difference between different demographic or not demographics, different geographical locations in terms of ability to express? Is that like because we're in Toronto or or populated regions, you see more expression, and as you veer further north, you see less? Is that almost a trend? Um, I, in some respects, yes. I I think like for my generation at least, like. We have a generation of indigenous artists who really didn't get a chance to explore um, music as a career or even as a as a, a form of self-expression until they left the home. Um, whereas now we're seeing a new generation who have parents who have invested in in, in music lessons and vocal coaching, have given them access to you know technology and instruments to to be able to you know explore those arts, forms of art and express themselves. I also note that. Um, like in, in Nunavut, it, it, it seems to me at least like the Inuit are incredibly prolific artists, not only through music, but also through visual arts like carving and painting and, and um, textile work. And so yeah. um, I think, uh, yeah, it really depends. I think um, the arts and uh, your ability to participate in them really depends on your family and your, your parents' ability or ability and access to resource, so their ability to invest in your in your in your opportunities, and for a lot of First Nations and even Inuit folks, uh, we have uh, a, a generation of parents who went to residential schools, and so that generation never had parents, mm -hmm. never learned how to be parents, and so had a hard time figuring out that you know kids need investment, kids need time, kids need resources, and so I think that's the the next generation that's following in our footsteps has. A bit more of those opportunities but we still need to give them more i want to give that a, a nice slow cap that's phenomenal where if you were to spend two minutes with an artist that you just met on the road indigenous wherever where would you direct them for more resources in just a short amount um, of time I, yeah i i definitely recommend a number of podcasts i'll, I'll be recommending yours um, as well, but so a, a big one for me is definitely the um, CD Babies DIY Musicians podcast. Okay. Um, the Music Business podcast is another great one um, for just stories about like the creative process. I often recommend Broken Real, which is Malcolm Gladwell and Rick Rubin's podcast. Mm -hmm. And um, there's also the Indie Indiepreneur Creative Juice podcast, which is digs into more into, yeah. like I was, yeah, mentioning the um, the merchandise game. Um, the funnel game, um, online marketing, um, mailing lists, uh, membership websites, uh, all this, the social media stuff and uh, e-commerce stuff. So I think it's, yeah, directing them there. If that's their learning style, though, like I, I recognize that everyone has different learning styles. I learn through listening. So podcasts are great for me. But um, other people learn through through reading. Other people learn through talking it out. Other people just need to experience things. And so yeah, for um, for folks that are like myself, it's my, like myself and learn through listening. I think the podcasts are definitely a, are the best way to go. I think, obviously, well, I'm I'm a little biased. I'd have to agree that podcasts are a phenomenal way to go because of the intimate nature that you can get and um, the fact that you can listen to it on the go while doing anything else. But a good part about podcasting too is that it's very it makes networking even easier because the listener can reach out to you afterwards. They can reach out to me afterwards and make that connection and learn a little bit more as well. So you can, you can network and do all of that as a beginner artist from these different 
resources and then grow your network even more, which is, I think, essential in order to grow as, as an individual anywhere. No? What's your take on that? Yeah. No- Networking is super important. Like I often say that, you know, it, it's not about who you know, it's about who knows you, who's going to like reply to your email, who's going to pick up your phone call, who's going to um, like accept a meeting request. And so again, like the networking part is extremely important. And for me, like the Juno Awards are probably the, the best networking event for me in Canada, at least. Um, so I try to attend that every year. This is usually like four or five days of programming and events. And so, um, yeah, getting to, to like, buy somebody a drink, um, sit, sit with them for coffee or, or go out for dinner with them, I think is extremely valuable because then you get to connect on a personal level. And really, I think like networking is about just showing people that you have some common ground and that you're not going to be a jerk. Um, I think like music industry in Canada is especially small. Um, and so everyone knows everyone and bad news travels really quickly. And so again, I think networking, the importance is, uh, of networking is, is developing a, a group of people who know you and, and know what to expect from you. I never actually framed it that way. It's not who you know, but it's who knows you because yeah, you can say this and this and that, but are they actually going to respond? Boom. Yeah. It, it's a yeah, huge it's paradigm hard shift too, for me. Like, Oh man, it's hard. Like I mentioned Mauricio and Jay and Guillaume, like those are my buddies, but again, like it's hard to get them to reply to text messages every once in a while. <laughs> like I'm yeah. working with this one kid um, out here in Winnipeg named uh, Muhammad. I've been trying to like pitch him to Mauricio for a while and Mauricio is just not, not replying to the, yeah. like I'm sending him some demos and stuff. Like have a listen to this guy. Like I, I believe him. He's wonderful, but yeah. You know, getting on, getting the, getting in the, in the business zone, it's, it's still super hard for people that you've known for a long time. Like I, I was down in LA with Jay um, last year before the pandemic. And like, we were just rolling. Uh, I picked him up at work and then we were going to a friend's house. Oh, we're going to the E1 house um, in LA to watch the Raptors game. And just on the, on the way there, Jay was like juggling multiple cell phones. I think he had two or three cell phones going at the same time <laughs> and a laptop just when I was Come driving, on. I was like, man, this guy is like, yeah, stretch pretty thin. Yeah. And so again, like getting, even getting friends to reply to emails and text messages is hard. And so I think like, it's not only like hitting them up when you need something, but also like congratulating them on accomplishments, like, and, uh, and sharing their content online and, and liking and engaging with their social media yeah. content and their artist content. And uh, it goes a long way. And not, yeah. 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 Cause Gav- Gavin Shepard's another example. Like he's one of my buddies, but again, it's hard to get him to reply and to listen to stuff. Cause again, I was trying to get Muhammad on his radar too, but Gavin's super busy. Yeah. I bet when you're networking and you're trying to make new connections with people, do you ever share some of your nerdy business stories? Um, yeah, we definitely talk about like struggles and, and what's working, what's not working and resources. Like I am like, I think like, it's hard. Like you, I, I feel like we're all running um, all the time. And so to, to have an opportunity to sit down dinner and slow down and, and have real conversations is, is super valuable. And so get that when I get those opportunities, I, I try to take them up as much as possible. Do you have, do you have a specific story that you'd, read about recently that you think might be beneficial to us well no like um honestly not really like i think the most the recent thing that i had was tool man from tribe called red he was on this new app called clubhouse and i guess it's like a insiders only app for now at least um where like people in entertainment just get together and and talk about um talk about different issues so they'll open a room and like anyone who's on the clubhouse app app can can go in and listen so like that's interesting like in the weekend like i was listening to tiffany haddish talk about random things with with joe budden <laughs> and, um, and so like yeah it's just like you go on there and there's like a bunch of incredible people uh, just talking about just like talking. different issues yeah just chatting and, and sharing their their challenges and some of the the things that they've learned about and so like i was just on a call with tim talking about a new album project and um and then he said hey are you on this app yet and i said no so he, he sent me an invite and, and so i've just been digging in the last uh, i guess it's been about four days now interesting interesting so yeah wanna... that's all about networking again 
Like if I didn't know Tim, I wouldn't know about Clubhouse. And then when I logged in, like Mauricio's on there, Gavin's on there, Jay's on there. And there's a bunch of other people that I've been trying to meet that are also on there. So just right it's, there. Uh, it's great to, At your fingertips to hear now. from them. And yeah. Yeah. Now I want to, I want to switch. We're talking about networking, but when you're meeting sponsors and potential people that you want to work with, I know that there are some partnerships that you're not willing to dabble in. How do you handle those situations? You can list specifically uh, well, the different co like companies that you don't, wouldn't want to, I came across online. But um, just curious to see how, how that situation unfolds. Yeah, for the second Heway Festival, we take our, our relationship with indigenous youth really seriously. And so we don't work with predatory lenders with alcohol, cannabis, or a nicotine brands. Um, we don't work with um, uh, in institutions who have invested in um, uh, pipelines or in the environment or the destruction of the environment. Um, and so uh, it's, yeah, it's really important for us not to have their logos on any of our products, our projects, and not to, to, to give them access or to give them our approval for what they're doing. And so, uh, again, that's just for the festival. And um, sponsorship is a really tough game to get into first and foremost. And so we're already limiting the amount of people that we can work with. But I think... I feel better about not working with them because I think it's important for Indigenous youth to know that we're not just um, there to to make money and to to see them as an audience that is going to potentially endorse these products or buy those products. Uh, we see them as like a part of our community and we're accountable to that community. And, and that's one of the ways we prove it. It goes further than money. Yeah, I agree. What is your approach when dealing with them? Do you have a vetting process? Do do these companies even approach you to sponsor you, or is it just no, not really? Like separate? I said, like corporate sponsorship is very competitive, and so we're also in Winnipeg, which makes it harder to to meet with the, the even corporate more, yeah. sponsor or the partnership um, people with made like bigger corporations, and uh, we also don't have the the staff to be able to compete for those opportunities or even provide the level of customer service that they usually expect from our Canadian counterparts. And so we just simply don't engage them. And when we have had a couple in the past, um, but when we found out that they've been investing in pipelines, we decided to cut ties with them. And so we made it pretty clear. Then you're out. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. All the work that we do in this industry is for self. What's your take on that? I think for some people it is. It definitely is an, from an artist, you need to love yourself um, to be able to, to you know, be front and center for a lot of things. But there are folks like myself who are comfortable being in the, in, in the background. And, uh, and so it's not, um, there is a place for everybody in the music industry, I believe. And uh, even introverted people who, you know, enjoy sitting typing and, and not leaving the house, there's a place for you in the music industry as well. Yeah, yeah. Also being in the background, you have the ability or the luxury, not the luxury, you have this being said about you. Sometimes you have artists tell you that they don't know where they would be without your help. Specific example, Kaylee Cardinal, what goes through your head when you receive these kinds of messages? The emotion. What tell tell us about that? Oh, it's it's really nice to hear those kind of things because um, I don't know that a lot of artists really understand how much work um, we do on the management side for free. Um, and so, especially in the beginning um, stages, there's a lot of just like writing bios or compiling discographies. Like I just started working with. Um, the Northern Cree Singers, which is an indigenous powwow group from Alberta. And mm -hmm. these guys have 49 albums to their credit. They started in 1982. Uh, they've got nine Grammy nominations and uh, uh, more than 130,000 followers on Facebook. And so they've got a sizable market. Yep. But it's just like right now we've got a uh, spending a lot of, I spent a whole day on Friday just um, doing the discography and the awards and nominations, just compiling that list together. Because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's incredible. They had 40 nominations, 18 wins, 49 albums released, um, along with, I think, about eight singles, maybe. Uh, we haven't even got to the performance history for 2019 yet. And so it's um, there's so much work that has to be done in the beginning stages that yeah. um, 
I, it's it's nice when you hear artists actually um, thank you for that kind of work because, like I said, it's it's usually unpaid recognition, acknowledgement. They're not necessary, but they go a long way. A simple thank you, a smile, you know. Yeah, like I think like you, the music industry is so small. Like I said, and you just want to spend your time working with nice people. And so um, reciprocity is very important and in, in acknowledging the work that the people around you are doing is very important. And so I always try to respect um, everybody that's working um, with me and, and on different projects and acknowledging them. And it's, it's a lesson I learned early on in my career from Heather Bishop, who is uh, like a legendary um, iconic uh, folk singer here in Manitoba. And mm -hmm. she told me from the beginning, like, you know what? if you're going to a concert or you're promoting a concert, just make sure that you're nice to the door people. Make sure that you're nice to the volunteers. Be nice to the grumpy sound guys and grumpy <laughs> sound people. Um, because yeah. those are the people that Did are- Did you know, hear that? That's the most I'm... important lesson of the episode today, Louis. Everyone has yeah. to be nice to you except for me. You're my grumpy sound guy. And you're never nice to me. Yeah. <laughs> So you got to acknowledge them, like acknowledge them from the stage if you're an artist and, uh, you know, be nice to them, give them time. Um, oftentimes for one concert, that's already like dozens of hours of work that they've done just to get you to that moment. And just so there. I think it's, yeah. yeah. Respect, it's beautiful. reciprocity is very important. Beautiful. Beautifully said. Thank you, Alan. Our fifth and final segment for today is Clear the Air. Yo, Grumpy Sound Guy, you, you were on cue. You did it perfectly today. I appreciate nice. you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> In Clear the Air, I'm going to throw a couple of different topics towards you to offer some clarity to our listeners. Perhaps they are unsure of how to navigate, and this is the light at the end of the tunnel, okay? Sounds good. Perfect. You own and operate the artist and project management firm Ogijita Arts. How did that come to be? Um, actually, it was, I think, in 2015 I launched that. It was basically me taking all the things I was learning and all the networks I was building um, while being at Manitoba Music and yep. implementing them. And so I had been gaining all this, this experience and these theories and had no place to really put them. Um, and so my first um, uh, step into management was with was with DJ Shub, and uh, we launched his album. I found his album on SoundCloud, actually, and I convinced him to hold off the release so that we could put some marketing support behind it, Yeah, um, along with some publicity and photos and everything. And so we were able to turn that. Um, he was willing to hold off, so I think we pushed that back nine months. We got a, a music video grant that Mad Ruck um, did for him, um, oh, cool. I think it's sitting at 2.4 million views right now. Yee! And then uh, so far. Yeah, we've got some good, good publicity. And like, honestly, he's just getting to, ready to release a, his second album now. As, and that's like, what, four years. So he's been eating and feeding his family um, for four years off of the strength of that one release that we were able to do. Get quite out of here. Back in 2016 or 2015. That's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of artists and the general public, I should say, don't realize how long these songs or albums or projects exist before they're actually released to the public. You know? Yeah, like he there's had, so he much had, background. Had the whole he had the whole EP ready to go and he posted like a preview on SoundCloud, like I said. And so I was able to get everything, register the works properly. And like right now during the pandemic, it's super like royalties are super important. Yeah. Um, for us in the indigenous community, we're so lucky to have channel 165 at Sirius XM because that translates to tens of thousands of dollars annually in royalties to the master owner and the feature performers. And so, um, again, registering the works properly is, a, is super important. I imagine that's part of the reason why almost delaying the process of releasing is important. But are there other details on why it may be important to wait and plan a proper release? To make sure that everything's in, in in order well you're competing with the world now and so i mean like there's streaming like i know this like was it bands in town on one podcast was talking about there being 
anywhere between 5,000 and 6,000 live streaming performances <laughs> online every day worldwide. <laughs> so the competition is incredible. Yeah. Um, the, and you're, you're competing with the world when you're releasing music as well. So doing it properly, having as many um, assets, as many partners set up, and as many, like, yeah, uh, reaches into new markets as possible is extremely important. And you need time to do that. And I know it's hard for artists to, like, create something and, and sit on it for that long, especially if there's no money coming in. And so, but I think it's extremely important to do it right and to, because these things can last a lot longer. The other thing that I that I want to note is that uh, last time I was at Sirius XM, I asked them like, what are your priorities for rotation? And they said, anything released in the last four months is their priority at Sirius XM. And so new music is really important. And if you're looking at maximizing your royalties from Sirius XM, I often tell artists that it's important to, to maybe release a single every three or four months instead of like what Spotify would expect and, and like maybe even weekly. Um, because if you if you time it out like that, you have a greater chance at getting more streams or more rotation and more royalties from Sirius XM. What if you just released on Sirius three to four months? Um, yeah, you could you do still... that. You could do like a, a release in, a, in advance of the, the digital streaming services. Um, you could even do like what I would love to have, to be honest. I remember I went and see John Legend at Massey Hall back mm. in the early 90s. Or maybe it was the early 2000s. It was the early 2000s. And the cool thing about that concert is that he had um, an acoustic version of the album for sale for only people that attended the concerts. Ooh. So I, I love that idea. That's I would brilliant. love to have an acoustic uh, version of Daniel Caesar's last couple of albums that's not available on streaming services. Maybe it's just like a limited edition vinyl. And so That's like awesome. staggered releases, different releases for different markets is, I think is an extremely good idea. Interesting. Interesting. And is that the kind of work that will get you the arts embodies essentially? Um, no, you know, for most part, it's, um, I like the developmental stage of, of the artist career. So with Kaylee Cardinal, I'm trying to find her a manager with more <laughs> time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also like right now, most of my artist management time is being spent on Northern Cree and Kaylee Watts. And Kaylee Watts is the um, singer songwriter from Bella Coola that I'm working with. And so okay. I really like the, the process of getting the, the details together, getting the business together and doing the artist development stuff. Um, in Canada, we're just so lucky to have like factor the foundation assisting Canadian talent and recording. We're super yeah. lucky to have the Canada council for the arts. I mean, yeah. these, these opportunities give us a chance to do things that artists in the U.S. can't. And so, like I said, with, with Kaylee Watts, she's doing like five months of co-writing. And so that's not only helping her develop her songwriting skills and her catalog, but also expo like helping her build her artistic network. And those yep. artists will introduce her to uh, potential labels, potential yep. publishers, publicists, um, you know, people that can support her releases in the future. Yeah. And it's, so, yeah. it's exponential. It's exponential because that so one great. person knows 10 per people and so on and so forth. It's very cool. So yeah, along with factor, I would recommend like looking at the explore and create program at, at the Canada council for the arts for anybody okay. who's listening, because there's such great, such great programs. there, such great support. And like I said, she like Kaylee Watts is doing a bunch of co-writes, but we're also, sending money out to these collaborators um, to guarantee their time. Because what I've learned, at least over the last couple of years, is that co-writing is not guaranteed. Like you might have like 10 co-writes set up in Los Angeles over a couple of weeks. And the chances, I don't know, sometimes, sometimes those collaborators cancel. And so I think like if you're yeah. able to like include a little bit of money, it just makes them like, it guarantees the time or it makes it a little harder to, to, to slough you off or, or to try to reschedule a co-writing session. Of course, there's higher incentive. It's higher incentive, yeah. essentially. Especially at the beginning stages of the career. And that's, I think that's where you really need is when nobody knows you. If you can say, you know what, I've got like a little bit of money to pay you for your time. I think that that opens up a lot more doors. Whereas like when you're doing, like you're a little further on in your career and you're well known or you've got some, some momentum, I think definitely you don't need to, pay people for their then, yeah. time 
yeah, collaboration is uh, it's it's, yeah. it's a reward oftentimes. So it's an investment. Yeah, just ultimately, in the beginning stages. Yeah. yeah, just in the beginning stages is something that I like to include in the grants. It's cool. Tell us about Passport Music Export Summit. What's going on there? Yeah, I actually participated in that, and so I wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a project that I was involved in running or setting up when I was at Manitoba Music, and so last year I participated in it, and. Um, I, I do quite well in classroom settings. And so it was a good, op good experience for me. I got to ask a lot of really specific questions. I got to really dig into the, the details of producer agreements as well. And I don't know that enough artists, especially in the beginning stages, um, have producer agreements or even some producers. I don't know if they have producer agreements and know like what the industry norms are for points on the record or, or, percentages of the future performer royalties um, and all the terms. And so it was great. Like I also got a chance to connect with Angelica Heim, I believe is how you pronounce her name. She's a, a lawyer. She's uh, actually Daniel Caesar's lawyer, Jesse Reyes's lawyer. And she's been like great for networking uh, with this um, Kaylee Watts grant. We spent, uh, spent some time with her digging into producer agreements as well so that Kaylee Watts knows what to expect um, when we get to that stage. And so, yeah. yeah, it's been great for networking and also like a good tip, um, that I, a good tip that I learned from, um, from passport was from a business manager and that business manager basically said, you know what, if an artist has a business manager and you have a management agreement with them with a sunset clause, um, technically the business manager is obligated, legally obligated to fulfill the terms of your management agreement. So if you part ways with an artist and huh. they're just like ghosting you and don't want anything to do with your, your fees anymore, um, you can take it to the business manager. So it's also, it's, it's just, just a safeguard for, for artist managers who are working with artists and maybe part ways at some point to, to make sure that your, the terms of your agreement are, are fulfilled. Yeah. It happens. It happens. So it's better to be prepared. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And same, same with producers. Like, you know, you want to make sure that the, the producer, there's so many things to, to make sure of and to double check. And so those agreements are super valuable. Cross your T's, dot your I's. Definitely. Lastly, Even if it's with oh, a friend. My bad. It's true. It's true. Business is different than your relationship, personal relationships. Yeah. Producing the Sakihiwe Festival. We spoke about it a little bit. But I want to touch on what you plan on doing with it in the next 12 months. I found that you are taking the brand abroad, hoping to learn a little bit more about that. Yeah, so we're re right now we're actually working with the High Commission of Canada in the United Kingdom to produce a series of um, conversations between Indigenous artists and trailblazers in our community, which is great because they're helping us market it overseas to the audience in the UK. Uh, we just started talking about extending that into 2021. We also have a partnership with the Canadian Consulate or the Canadian Cultural Centre in Paris. And so the idea is to take a, a group of four Indigenous acts over to Paris for a week of meetings and performances uh, to help them to build teams in, in that market. And so it's um, working with mostly the consulates and the High Commission um, to, to help Indigenous artists build um, teams and markets and audiences and tour routes um, that right. uh, they can do on their own in the future. And so that's, that's kind of uh, the extension of our, our brand overseas. And because our role in the community, the indigenous community at least, is, is more of a develop, developmental platform. So helping them build skills. With our festival, it's mostly like an introduction to the festival experience mm -hmm. where they're going to be advancing shows where they have to um, understand what uh, high resolution photos are, stage plots and tech writers, what goes into them. And also simple things like signing contracts, understanding what copyrights are involved in, um, and, and reporting music to, or reporting set lists um, to SoCan. All those little steps that, you know, more exper experienced artists might take for granted is what we try to um, give at the festival. And then again, like I said, the, um, the export missions, the stuff overseas is for the people that have had an opportunity to build, build teams and are just looking to extend those overseas. It's incredible work. It's incredible work. We do have a, a fan of Susan Aguacark. Oh, Aguacark. What was it like working with her? 
Oh, she was really great. Like I've never met Susan before. We did our honor song project with her. And, um, and so talking to her on Zoom for the first time was really cool because she's an icon, like triple platinum records back in the 90s and uh, still doing a lot of it, like really important work for the Inuit communities and Inuit youth. And so, and just talking to some of the Inuit artists that I know of my generation, like they look up to her, like she's done so much. She's blazed so it's much wild. trail. And so it's like, yeah, having her um, experience and her voice and her support was really, was really incredible. Do you just feel the energy exuding through like the screen even? Yeah, definitely. There's so much passion the there, conversations, no? Because the, the thing is that when we recorded our, our episode with her, she was actually not feeling well. And so we had booked the um, World Music Center in Toronto for her to go in and perform and, f and, and do the conversation with a great camera crew and professional lighting and everything and sound. Yeah. Uh, but she wasn't feeling well. So the, the night before, we actually had to cancel everything and then find a webcam. Um, and it turned out uh, she had to get her appendix removed um, not too long after oh, that. Oh, wow. So, yeah. I'm just glad that it wasn't COVID related because um, uh, I know that it's, it's it's probably easier to to heal from an appendix surgery than it is from this, from this <laughs> coronavirus. Yeah, it by it seems like it. It seems like it. We've got one final question from a guest, which was pre-recorded. I'm gonna pull that up for you, right here. Okay. Hey, Alan. Um, what was the hardest part of leaving Manitoba music after having spent 13 years there? And, uh, and making all the connections that you did. You just watched the video from Alon Jordan. What's your response to that? Thanks for the question, Alon um, or Alan. Uh, uh, I think the hardest part was the um, not knowing um, when the next paycheck is going to come in, taking that risk, uh, taking that jump into the private sector. But I mean, like, I think it's, it's important to have some good support set up in, in your home and your family. And if not, then... Um, hopefully saving money and uh, making sure that you can continue to pay the bills while you're pursuing or, and building this new, these new businesses. Beautiful, beautiful. It is a leap of faith, but you got to take it and beautiful things come from that. Yeah, definitely. That is everything today, Alan Grayeyes. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of this. Do you have any final words before we wrap things up here? Um, no, I think, well, maybe, yeah. I think like there's so many conferences, so many seminars and panels that you can watch now to learn about the music industry and i think like for anyone who's um just uh, starting out on their artistic career or starting out on their on the business uh, it's important to just learn it every day and that's what i do is i dig into something every day whether it's like social media or uh, advertising uh, publicity um, even learning like video editing skills i think it's important to do those every day um, because there's going to be a time where email becomes overwhelming mm -hmm. and you won't have uh, the same um, spare time that you do now. So when you're starting out, you have more time when you get to a certain point, um, all the communications, all the daily work Absolutely. can be overwhelmed. It catches up and it, it picks up really quick. Where can our listeners find you? Um, well, I think like the easiest way is to just look at the Sakahiwe Festival website which is S-A-K-I-H-I-W-E dot C-A. Um, I have um, a, a public Twitter account as well, but I mostly just like retweet things. I don't have very thought provoking uh, posts on there. <laughs> and so again, I think like just stay up to date with what's happening um, through the Sakahiwe website. Fantastic, fantastic. That brings us to the very end. I want to say thank you to our listeners as always. We hope you had a fantastic time. I said fantastic three times, so I'm going to stop saying that now. I want to say thank you to our grumpy sound guy. You did a fantastic job. Wow, look at me go. Fantastic. <laughs> and a shout out to Prevail Media Group. Without this facility, this would not be. Obviously, shout out to you, Mr. Alan Gray Eyes. Thank you so much for your time and your attention and your energy. We out. Fantastic, sir. Thank you for listening. If you found any value in this episode and you want to learn more from our content, check out our website at goproduce.ca. If you're on Instagram, check out our handle at go.produce. If you're on YouTube, subscribe. If you're on Spotify, hit download. If you're on Apple Music, leave a review. This will all help us grow our community. I'm Big Lou, and this is Go Produce. Go Produce.